Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. That's halftime, ladies and gentlemen. What a game of Texas football. Baylor University is up by a touchdown after absolutely dominating A&M for those first two quarters, and... <laughs> Look at that! Baylor's putting on a little show for the A&M cadets. They've certainly earned some gloating rights after their team's performance here at the Cotton Palace. Wait a minute. The A&M cadets aren't too keen on the joke. Some of them are making a rush for the field, and... There's a fight breaking out, folks! Students from both sides are streaming down the stands. Please, stay in your seats, everybody. It's like an all-out riot down there. It's worse than 1924. Break it up, break it up! Ladies and gentlemen, please stay in your seats. There's a boy down there swinging something. Put it down, kid. He, he cracked that boy's head clean open. Medic, we need a medic on the field. Please, everyone, back to your seats. This is our first episode on the murder of Charles Sessoms during a 1926 college football riot. This week we'll cover Sessoms' life and the sports rivalry that led to his death. Next week we'll cover the riot's aftermath and an alleged conspiracy to protect his killer. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. On November 30th, 1899, Texas A&M's college football squad headed to Waco to face off against Baylor University's team for the first time. They were two new teams playing a relatively new sport. Neither of them had even selected official names or mascots yet. The sport itself was just getting started, as the first college football game had only taken place 30 years earlier. Teams hadn't even agreed on an official set of rules until 1876, when Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Columbia penned the first college football rule book. Those early rules were distinctly different from the game we know today. For instance, the forward pass was illegal. Field goals and touchdowns were both worth five points. Teams only had to make it five yards per first down, and the football itself was almost the size of a watermelon. Texas A&M's team had only played the game for five years, but that was five more years than Baylor. A&M easily decimated Baylor, beating them 33 points to zero. The A&M players were presumably in high spirits as they set off back to College Station, Texas. But they had classes and lives waiting for them back on campus, so the Baylor win likely faded from their minds while they rode. None of them realized they had just begun a century-long rivalry. The competition truly took hold a few years later. On Thanksgiving 1901, Baylor finally got payback for that embarrassing shutout in 1899. Baylor devastated Texas A&M with a stunning blowout. The final score was Baylor 47, A&M 0. The defeat had to sting for the boys from Texas A&M, but they knew that they would have a chance at redemption in 1902. And in the meantime, there were other ways to get back at their new rivals. Hi there, Barbara. I was wondering, if you weren't doing anything tonight, would you be interested in grabbing a malted with me? Darn. Sorry, Reggie. I've already got plans with Chet. Chet? I don't think I know Chet. You wouldn't. He's not from around here. Hey there, Barbara. Oh. Sorry if I'm interrupting, big guy. Wait, I do know you. You're on the A&M football team, aren't you? What are you doing in Waco? Hey, the drive doesn't feel so long when you know Barbara's waiting on the other side. <laughs> oh, Chet. <laughs> See you on the gridiron, Chief. In the early 1900s, Texas A&M was an all-boys university with a focus on military science. Once the cadets noticed all the women on Baylor's co-ed campus, they reportedly started making regular trips to Waco for dates. 
Baylor was a Baptist school, and some of the female student body seemed to prefer these out-of-town boys with military backgrounds over the pious church-going crowd in Waco. The Baylor boys didn't welcome the new competition. Just to add insult to injury, the Texas A&M football team made sure that Baylor's 1901 win was only a fluke. For the next five years, A&M dominated Baylor. Seven games went by without Baylor scoring a single point. But the budding rivalry came to a grinding halt in 1905 when a series of deaths threatened to put an end to football. On November 25, 1905, three players in three separate football games were killed on the field. A 19-year-old Union College halfback died after being kicked in the head during a play. Another got hit so hard in the chest that a rib went straight through his heart. The youngest, a high school student in Missouri, was knocked unconscious by hard tackle and never woke up. He was only 16. Over a dozen more football players died in similar ways in 1905. At least 150 were hurt on the field and left with broken backs, necks, or concussions. It became such a widespread problem that Baylor decided to ban the sport entirely for the upcoming 1906 season. Eventually, President Teddy Roosevelt even decided to get involved. Roosevelt was a fan of football, but his own son had been injured during a college game. So towards the end of 1905, he called a meeting of prominent college football coaches and staff to the White House to see how they could make the sport safer. You should be ashamed. Come around to this side of the table and say it to my face. Gladly. Enough! Quiet down, gentlemen. Let's sort this one out. My boys are dying on the field. We owe it to them to suspend all games until we figure out a fix. We can't put an end to an entire sport here. Listen. I believe in outdoor games, and I don't mind in the least that they're rough games or that those who take part in them are occasionally injured. But death is another beast entirely. The rules need to change. Well, what if the boys could just pass the ball ahead of them instead of just laterally? It would break them out of their pack at least. I might not be completely opposed. And what if we pause the game whenever someone landed on the ball so players don't just start piling on top of each other? (laughs) <laughs> Hold on. We're trying to help the sport, not fully emasculate it. <laughs> <laughs> the colleges finally agreed on a new set of rules in 1906 and revolutionized the sport completely. Suddenly, it was legal to throw the ball down the field and to punt. A 1906 newspaper article by Swarthmore College football coach George Brook detailing the new rules recommended that coaches start their men catching and passing, and kickers should be developed at once. Football as we know it today was born. With the new rules in place, Baylor decided to bring its team back together. And when they faced off against Texas A&M again in 1908, they finally took home a win. Baylor students couldn't stop A&M from stealing their dates outside the field, but at least they could hold their own on the gridiron. A few years later, the two schools finally decided to make their rivalry official. In 1916, the administration at Baylor and Texas A&M signed a contract ensuring that the teams would go head-to-head for one big game every year. A&M agreed to travel to the Baylor campus every season so the teams could play at Waco's brand new Expo Center, the Cotton Palace. But in order to keep it from feeling like a Baylor home game, they split the tickets down the middle. From now on, half the stadium's audience would be Baylor fans, the other half would be reserved for A&M. The Cotton Palace game quickly became one of the biggest college football games in Texas. The rivalry between the two teams kept getting bigger, and so did the tension in the stands. In 1922, the newly named Baylor Bears beat A&M's team, now known as the Aggies. But as Baylor students streamed onto the field to celebrate the victory, The Aggies fans angrily headed down to defend their team's honor. But before things could get out of hand, the fire department showed up to turn their hoses on them. The water managed to calm down the crowd that time, but it didn't stop the hostility brewing between the two schools. And soon, the rivalry erupted into bloody violence. A 
up next, we'll meet Charles Sessoms, an A&M cadet who found himself in the middle of a football rivalry that turned deadly. In the fall of 1922, a young man named Charles Sessoms began his first year at Texas A&M. Sessoms was already 20 at the time, a few years older than his fellow freshmen. Sessoms had graduated from Forest Avenue High School in Dallas in 1918, but he decided to keep living at home with his parents and look for a job in town. He found one as a jewelry clerk in downtown Dallas. Sessoms was hardworking and beloved by his teachers, and he likely brought that same ethic to his job. He quickly worked his way up the ranks at his jewelry store. By 1922, Sessoms had already been promoted to salesman. But when his younger brother, Harry, graduated from high school that spring and enrolled at Texas A&M, Sessoms had a change of heart. Welcome home, brother. How was work? Don't even get me started, Harry. Some kid nabbed a necklace and made it out the door before I saw him. Chased him halfway down the block. boy, Charles. I left a customer in the store while I did it. When I came back with the necklace, a whole row of promise rings were missing. How much are they paying you? Not enough. Well, why don't you quit? Come along to college with me this fall. I know you've got the grades for it. I don't know. Come on, brother. Don't you want more? Or are you going to keep chasing kids down the street for the rest of your life? Sesums decided to leave the jewelry world behind and become an Aggie at A&M alongside Harry. It was a decision that would eventually cost him his life. On Saturday, November 1st, 1924, thousands of Sesum's fellow cadets from Texas A&M filled the streets of Waco for another face-off against the Baylor Bears. 25,000 fans reportedly filled the stands at the Cotton Palace that day. It was the biggest football crowd the city had ever seen. It was a close game. The Aggies and the Bears kept the score tied for most of it, but at halftime, a few Baylor students piled into a Ford painted red and white, the school's colors, and drove onto the field. The car was known around campus as the Bucking Ford because it had a statue of a farmer riding a barrel mounted to the back. The Ford tore around the field to the cheers of the Baylor fans, but when it veered straight towards the A&M football team resting on the sidelines, the moment took a different turn. The Baylor student behind the wheel narrowly avoided their rival players. To the A&M fans in the crowd, the moment was a little too close for comfort. The teams came back to play the second half, but some cadets in the stands couldn't forget about that near miss with the bucking Ford. And when a Baylor player named Ralph Pittman slipped past the Aggies' defensive line for a spectacular 60-yard game-winning touchdown, things went from bad to worse. After the game, Baylor fans took to the field to celebrate the victory, and a horde of angry A&M cadets headed down after them. Harry, don't go down there. Don't get in the middle of it. You going to let Baylor get away with that? Where's your school spirit? They almost ran our boys over, but the entire Baylor crowd doesn't have to pay for it. Hey, cadet, look over. She didn't do anything. Luckily, the Waco Police Department was able to break up the fans before it turned into a full-on brawl. But at least one young Baylor girl was hurt during an attack by an A&M cadet. Afterward, her father put up a massive reward of $250, the equivalent of nearly $4,000 today, for anyone who could identify the culprit. But it seems like no one ever turned the boy in. After the escalating violence in 1922 and 1924, Baylor announced that the slogan for 1925's matchup would be sportsmanship, then victory. If Baylor meant the line to be a slight against the unsportsmanlike conduct of A&M's cadets the year before, the administration played innocent. But everyone was on high alert when the two teams met for their annual game in October of 1925 particularly because the game was scheduled for Halloween night. Come on, Charlie. We're all taking the train down to Waco tonight. I think I'll pass. I saw how it was last year. You young guys can be such hotheads. Spare me the high and mighty act, brother. You're not even three years older than me. I have a paper to write this weekend. We're only in college once. 
You're an Aggie! Quit hiding up here in your room and come act like one! Hmm. How long until the train leaves? That's more like it! But by all accounts, the game was peaceful. At least in the stands. On the football field, Texas A&M crushed Baylor with a 13 to nothing shutout. As frustrated and sad as the cadets were after their loss the year before, the big win on Halloween brought their spirits soaring back. Oh, we wrecked them! We destroyed them! <laughs> I was there too! You don't have to scream at me! Oh, 13 to zip! They couldn't even make a field goal! Just wait till next year! We'll get you back! Oh, I'll see you there! Find me in the stands. I'd love to watch your face when you lose. All right, all right, big brother. Cool it down. Let's get you home. It seemed like the two colleges managed to live up to Baylor's slogan that afternoon. Both teams and their fans were absolutely sportsmanlike at the Cotton Palace. Baylor's dean, W.S. Allen, later called the whole day perfectly wonderful. But if Allen thought one friendly game meant the bloody rivalry was behind them, he was wrong. The next game between the Baylor Bears and the Texas A&M Aggies was scheduled for Saturday, October 30th, 1926. But as thousands of students began filling the city of Waco on Friday in preparation for the weekend game, one thing seemed clear. The cheerful rivalry of 1925 was gone. By Friday night, a local Waco newspaper reported that multiple fistfights had already broken out among some football fans, and it ominously warned that there could be more so-called hand-to-hand battles to come. On Saturday morning, another train from College Station, Texas, arrived in Waco. It held the school's entire football team, the school's band, and a few hundred fellow students who hadn't made the trip down on Friday. But one group wasn't with them, the Aggies' Corps of Cadets. Most years, the 2,000 members of the school's military leadership program led a march down the streets of Waco before the big game against Baylor. That morning, the Corps of Cadets was nowhere to be found. The huge group had decided to skip the Baylor game so they could make an appearance when A&M played Southern Methodist University in Dallas later that season. That meant that this year, when the 13,000-person audience streamed through the gates of the Cotton Palace Stadium on Saturday afternoon, only several hundred were A&M fans. The rest of them were rooting for Baylor. The Aggies were vastly outnumbered and the few who showed up likely weren't happy with Baylor's packed and rowdy section of the stands. One a and cadet who made it to the Cotton Palace that day was Charles Sessoms. Sessoms was a senior at this point. His next six months would be a busy race towards graduation, but on that Saturday, he likely only had Baylor on his mind. Get a load of all the Baylor co-eds, Harry. You could be selling necklaces back in Dallas right now. But look at us! College seniors. I owe it all to you, little brother. Thank you for just- Oh, spare me the sappy story, Charles. Let's go find us some good seats. From the look of this A&M turnout, we'll have plenty to choose from. That just means we'll have to cheer twice as hard. Charles Sessoms headed into the Cotton Palace and settled down to watch the big game. Just a month earlier, he had celebrated his 24th birthday. He would never make it to 25. Up next, we'll explore how the 1926 A&M versus Baylor game erupted into violent chaos and left Sesums dead. Now, back to the story. At 2 p.m. on October 30th, 1926, the Texas A&M band marched onto the Cotton Palace football field in Waco, Texas, and began belting out the school's fight song in front of the 13,000-person stadium. The tune, also known as the Aggie War Hymn, was first written by an A&M student during World War I. Its lyrics actually name-check A&M's other rivals, the University of Texas, but that day, all anyone in the Aggie crowd could think of was defeating Baylor. A few minutes from the 2.30 kickoff, A&M's head Yale leader, J.D. Langford, surveyed the audience from his spot on the field. 
As one of the school's yell leaders, Lankford had been elected by the student body to lead Aggie fans in a series of cheers. It was a well-respected role, and Lankford must have felt like he had a duty to look after his fellow A&M students. Because when he sensed something in the air that day he didn't like, he knew it was up to him to do something about it. Baylor! Baylor! Excuse me? What brings you all the way to this side of the field? You aren't planning to bring out the bucking Ford again, right? Well, there won't be a bucking Ford. Excellent, thank you. My Aggie crowd has a real edge on today, and if they see that car, there could be trouble that neither me nor anybody else can stop. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Now, if you'll excuse me. Right, sure, right. Uh, thanks again. With that, Langford headed back to his side of the field, and the game began. Unfortunately, things took a wrong turn for the Aggies almost immediately. a and won the initial coin flip and kicked off to Baylor, and Baylor almost returned the ball for a touchdown. By the end of the first quarter, the Aggies were down 6-0. to They managed to score one touchdown in the second quarter and nabbed the extra point, but the team couldn't hold their lead for long. By halftime, Baylor was back on top with 13 points to a and 7. Things weren't looking good for the Aggies. This wasn't the triumphant win the fans likely expected after last year's dominating shutout. The team was losing. The Aggie Corps of Cadets wasn't there to put on their usual performance at halftime. And just to add insult to injury, Baylor planned their own satirical halftime show. Look at them down there. They're dressed like cadets. They're laughing at our boys. Listen up. I'm your yell leader. Stay with me. Don't lose your cool and give them the satisfaction. That's better. Now, if we all just... Hey, look at that Ford. Oh, no. As some Baylor students put on a fake routine to make fun of the A&M cadets, a car barreled out onto the football field. But it wasn't the infamous bucking Ford that had almost mowed down a row of A&M players in 1924. This time, the car was painted in Baylor school colors and overflowed with Baylor women. Each one held a sign featuring the Baylor football team's winning scores over the years. And this was too much for the A&M crowd to handle. Langford looked at the car just in time to see a young cadet named W.L. Lee race towards it at full speed and leap onto the moving vehicle. Lee grabbed onto the car's back tire and held on, forcing it to come to a grinding halt. One of the women in the car went flying out of the side. Esther Didson, who had traveled from Houston to see the game that day, later explained what happened next to the Baylor College newspaper. One girl was knocked clear off the car. She rolled over several times and must have been pretty badly bruised. The Baylor boys made a rush for the car to save the girls and the lone boy at the wheel. At that point, a Baylor freshman later remembered, all hell broke loose. Hundreds of students from both sides streamed down to the field with any weapons that they could find. Some were carrying empty bottles, others had boards or pieces of the wooden chairs from the stands. The halftime performance had dissolved into a riot. And soon, Charles Sessoms leapt from his seat and joined in. It's unclear what exactly drew Sessoms into the riot. Some said that he had run down to the crowd to rescue a young woman who got trapped in the middle of the brawl. Another swore that Sessoms and some other upperclassmen were trying to break things up. But according to one of Sessoms' friends, E.A. Vance, the two of them ran down to the field for one purpose only, to protect their fellow Aggies and join the fight. Come on, Vance, boost me over the fence. I've got to get down there. One, two, three. That's it. I'm almost... Charles, look out! Just as Sessoms made it onto the field, a stocky man in a blue suit allegedly took a swing at the cadet with a four-foot club or a piece of a chair. Sessoms was able to dodge the attack and chase the man through the mayhem on the field. According to various witnesses, the man eventually turned and took another two swings with the weapon. Sessoms was able to block them both with his arm. But finally... The man cocked the wooden club back over his shoulder and let loose one last swing. 
which savagely connected with Sesum's skull. The blow was so loud that a witness said it sounded like a gun. Sesum's legs immediately buckled and he fell into a pile on the football field. The man looked down at him. Then he dropped the club and ran. Sesum's was crumpled on the ground with a riot raging around him. If he stayed there on the field, he was liable to get trampled, so two A&M cadets quickly ran to his side and dragged him to the safety of the sidelines. Get him up! Get him up! Look at the gash on his head. He's bleeding all over. Oh my, is he dead? I don't know. Stop yelling and help me lift him. He's still breathing. We need to get him out the field. Come on, cadet, up you go. The cadets dragged Sesums all the way to a first aid station. He was still conscious, but Sesums was bleeding from the head and seemed confused. How do you feel now, buddy? Did we win? You mean the game or the fight? The, the game? The, the fight? The game? Let's just take it easy. I, I'm fine. I, I'm all better. I, I just need to throw up. No, don't get up. Wait for the nurse. Nurse! Nurse! The nurse on duty gave Sesums a glass of ammonia and water, which caused him to vomit. But as he sat and waited for a doctor in the first aid tent, the brawl continued to spiral out of control. On the field, J.D. Langford was at a complete loss. Nothing the Yale leader could do would get his cadet's attention or stop them from pummeling the boys from Baylor. It was bloody, violent chaos. And then suddenly, he had a plan. Langford raced to the ford that had started this whole riot in the first place and climbed up to high ground. From this vantage point, he could see at least a hundred of his fellow students in the teeming mass of fists and bodies. But far off, he could also see the A&M band leader and he furiously tried to get the man's attention. Finally, Langford caught his eye and gave him a signal. The band leader understood at once. He rallied the band and all at once they started to play. The sound of the national anthem boomed out across the football field, and all at once, the fighting stopped. The violent spell was broken. A calm settled across the bruised and bloodied students from Baylor and Texas A&M. With that, both sides returned to their seats, and amazingly, the game continued. Baylor held their lead in the second half and beat the Aggies by 11 points. Many in the crowd likely worried that the defeat would break the fragile truce and reignite the riot once again. But it never happened. Instead, after the game, Lankford had every A&M student wait patiently for 30 minutes as the stadium cleared. When it was their time to leave, Lankford led them out through a side door to avoid the Baylor crowd. The violence was over, but for Charles Sessoms, the damage was already done. The 24-year-old A&M senior was dead by the next morning. The two colleges quickly agreed to work together to find the boy responsible. Over the next few days, though, their shaky truce dissolved into anger and blame and a potential conspiracy to protect the killer. Sir, do you know the way to the hospital? Which one? Which one? Heavens, I don't... We're just in from Dallas, and I'm not sure. Excuse me, are you Mr. and Mrs. Sessoms? Of course you are. Samuel Brooks, president of Baylor University. Ah, well, uh, I hope the train ride suited you fine. Listen, fella, it's a pleasure and all, but we don't have time to chat. Our boy's in the hospital. So if you aren't here to give us a ride, then... Sorry. That's why I'm here. Or not for the ride. I felt I had to tell you in person. Spit it out or step aside. We've got to get to the hospital. It's Charles. The injury was more serious than the doctor first thought. This is our final episode on the murder of Texas A&M student Charles Sessoms during a 1926 college football game. 
Last week, we covered the history of the A&M rivalry with Baylor University that culminated in a deadly riot. This week, we'll dive into the aftermath of Sesame's death and a potential conspiracy to protect his killer. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. On October 30th, 1926, the long-running football rivalry between Baylor University and Texas A&M finally came to a violent head. During halftime at the annual game at the Cotton Palace in Waco, Texas, a car full of Baylor's female students drove onto the field to mock the cadets from A&M. A&M was already losing the game and outnumbered in the stands, so what should have been a harmless tease from their rivals set off a fury in the A&M student section. Angry cadets streamed onto the field for revenge. On the other side of the 50-yard line, the Baylor students saw that the women in the car were in trouble, so they headed down to defend them. Within minutes, the entire Cotton Palace football field erupted into a full-blown riot. College students from both sides laid into one another with punches, kicks, and blows from any weapons they could find. Some of the young men wielded chairs they brought from the stands. Others swung scraps of wood salvaged from around the stadium. A Texas A&M senior named Charles Sessoms was one of the boys in the middle of the riot that afternoon. Sessoms was 24 older than most of his fellow Aggies. Later, Sesame's father would say that his son headed down to the field with only the most noble intentions. He wanted to break up the brawl and calm his younger, hot-headed classmates. But a friend of Sesame's who went to the game with him told a very different story. The student, E.A. Vance, said Sesame's headed down because he was looking for a fight. And that's exactly what he found. As A&M and Baylor pummeled one another on the football field, Sesames found himself face to face with a boy carrying a big club or piece of wood. The boy took a few small swings at Sesames, which he easily knocked away with his arms. But then suddenly, the boy cocked the club back over his shoulder and sent the makeshift weapon sailing in a wide arc at Sesames' head. It connected hard with the boy's left temple and opened a two and a half inch gash above his ear. It immediately started spilling blood. Sesames collapsed onto the ground, and his assailant, likely realizing what he'd done, slipped off into the chaos of the riot. If Sesames lost consciousness from the attack, he didn't stay out for long. He was able to walk and talk, or stagger and murmur, a few minutes later, when a pair of his fellow students hauled him to the safety of a nearby first aid station. The nurse on duty gave him a drink that caused him to puke, which he said made him feel better. But Charles Sesame still needed a doctor. Is there a doctor in the house? Raise your hand, Harry. That usher is looking for a doctor. It's probably just some brawler who got his nose broken. I came here to watch a game, not stitch up a belligerent freshman. We need some help down in the first aid section. Is anyone here a doctor? They sound serious. I just came off a two-day swing shift. I don't need... My husband is a doctor over here! Oh, for... Yes, right here. I'm the doctor. Lead the way. Around 4 p.m., Dr. Harold Lanham left his seat in the crowd to go check on the injured boy. Lanham was likely surprised when he saw Sesame's. His head was bloody, and large purple bruises were already spreading across the boy's face. Lanham inspected his skull, but he couldn't tell whether it had been fractured. Without the help of a real medical facility, there was nothing more he could do. So Lanham cleaned the finger-length gash above Sesame's ear, wrapped him in clean bandages, and headed back to catch the rest of the football game. You're back! Did they score again? And I missed it? Oh, cheer up, Harold. I know you love being a hero. Was everything all right? Some boy got his bell rung pretty bad. Gash in his head and everything. I think he'll be all right. Maybe serves him right for getting involved in that mess. Go! Go! That's a touchdown! Lanham checked back in on Charles Sessoms after the game. Texas A&M president T.O. Walton was already at the boy's bedside, holding his hand while Sessoms flickered in and out of consciousness. 
Lanham told Walton that Sesums needed to be under hospital supervision, at least for the night. But once Sesums got there, Lanham and his fellow doctors realized there was nothing they could do for him. He vomited up blood sometime after dinner time, and Lanham realized that the boy's skull almost certainly had been fractured by the blow. All he could do was give Charles Sesums a bit of morphine to help him rest and heal. Then, after midnight, Lanham finally left the hospital and went to bed. He headed back to check in on Sesums first thing the next morning. The boy's condition had gotten much worse throughout the night. At 9 a.m. on Sunday, October 31st, 1926, Charles Sesums died. Back so soon? That has to be a good sign. I'm sure he felt better after a good night. Harry? What's wrong? He's dead. Oh no. Harry. But last night I thought you Yesterday said- Yesterday at the stadium he seemed so big and broad-shouldered and tall, like a man. But there in the hospital bed he was so tiny, so young. You did everything you could. I could have stayed with him. I didn't need to go back and finish the game. I I I could have... There's no sense in that now. Look at me. Look at me. You're a good man, Harold Lanham. And a good doctor. There are things in this world that even you can't control. Let's get some food in you. The tragedy had already set in for Dr. Lanham, and it would only grow from there. By the time Charles Sesum's parents boarded a train in downtown Dallas and made a three-hour trip to visit their son, the boy was already dead. I tried to telephone from the hospital, but by that point you were already on your way. Please, accept my deepest sympathies. He was still a young man with so much life ahead of him. Oh, Charlie boy. Later that day, an inquest confirmed that Sesums died from complications of his skull fracture caused by a party or parties unknown. And by the time the Sesums family got their son's body back to Dallas and started prepping for the funeral on November 2nd, Texas A&M had launched an investigation to find out who, exactly, that unknown party might be and how to bring them to justice. Up next, we follow the two colleges on their quest to find Charles Sesum's killer and a possible conspiracy by the Waco mayor to protect him. Listeners, I have a surprising treat for you. You know you can find love in a bar or on an app. Why not a podcast? In Blind Dating, the new Spotify original from Parcast, we're expanding the places you can meet your match with a twist you'll never see coming. Every Wednesday, YouTuber and host Tara Michelle introduces one hopeful single to two strangers in a voice-only call. Through a series of illuminating games and questions, the trio finds all the sweetness and awkwardness of a first date, minus the distraction of appearances. But once our hopeful single chooses their match, the cameras are turned on, and it's either butterflies or goodbye. Blind Dating airs weekly with new episodes every Wednesday. You can find and follow Blind Dating free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Now back to the story. On November 2nd, 1926, the Texas A&M administration began an inquiry into the recent football stadium riot to uncover who was responsible for the murder of 24-year-old college senior Charles Sessoms. Unfortunately, it wasn't as easy as calling in a few witnesses. One by one, A&M officials questioned students who admitted to being involved in the riot on Saturday. But no one could put a name to Sessoms' killer. They could barely even come up with a clear description of him. He was short, tiny, a really small guy. Well, maybe Sesums was just tall, you know, but he was stocky. He was definitely small. That baseball bat looked huge. Baseball bat? It was a club. It was a bat. It was a hunk of wood. But there was one piece of information that nearly every witness could agree on. Blue suit. Blue surge suit. He was wearing a blue suit. 
The investigation concluded with only a vague picture of Charles Sessom's killer and a handful of dead-end leads. It seemed like the Texas A&M administration was more interested in public relations and damage control than actually bringing a murderer to justice. So, on November 3rd, only a day after Sessoms was laid to rest in a Dallas cemetery, Baylor President Samuel Brooks headed to the A&M campus to meet with its president, T.O. Walton. Together, the two men tried to figure out a way to put this mess behind them. After 10 grueling hours of deliberation, the two presidents and their trusted senior officials agreed on a way to put the deadly riot behind them. They sat down and penned a joint statement together where they agreed to split responsibility for the tragedy between both schools equally. We are profoundly saddened, as are the student bodies and the faculties of both institutions, by the death of Cadet Lieutenant Sessoms and sympathize deeply and sincerely with his bereaved family. Thank you. And with that, the two college presidents apparently felt satisfied. A football game had gotten a little out of hand on both sides, the friendly rivalry had turned to violence, and an unfortunate student had lost his life. It was both everyone's fault and nobody's fault. The men presumably thought that by sharing the blame, they could acknowledge what happened and move forward as friends. But when the statement hit their college campuses, it didn't cool down the A&M and Baylor rivalry at all. It pushed tensions to a whole new level. Just hours after the Baylor campus newspaper published the president's statements, Baylor students penned an angry rebuttal. They were furious that they should carry any of the blame at all. The riot was A&M's fault, plain and simple. And Baylor didn't want anything to do with them from now on. Baylor students are tired and disgusted with competing against a rival student body that disregards all points of honor, attacks women, runs gang-like over a few or one man, and seeks to bulldoze and browbeat a smaller student body by virtue of superior numbers and the mob spirit. We, the undersigned students of Baylor University, desire and urge a severance of all athletic relationships with a and College of Texas. The petition was signed by nearly a third of the entire Baylor student body. The A&M students were quick to respond with their own letter, this time accusing the Baylor students of purposefully inciting the riot and even stockpiling clubs and weapons in their section of the stands before the game. But as the two colleges traded increasingly hostile letters in their school papers, one thing became clear. This wasn't about Charles Sessoms. The students at Baylor and A&M only seemed to care about which school was responsible for starting the riot. Sessoms was just collateral damage. The larger Waco community apparently felt the same way. After the first round of A&M interviews came up empty-handed, all discussions of finding Sessoms' killer faded fast. The local police never even opened an official murder investigation. But back in College Station, Texas, a group of A&M alumni still wanted answers. And if the Waco authorities weren't going to find them, then it was time to take matters into their own hands. So they pooled their resources and called up the infamous Pinkerton Detective Agency to look into Charles Sessom's death. On November 22, 1926, a Pinkerton detective named Ella Floyd Benedict pulled into Waco, Texas. Pinkerton was America's first private security and detective agency, with roots as far back as the Civil War. The 34-year-old Benedict was the latest in a long line of Pinkerton detectives who had rescued Abraham Lincoln, hunted Jesse James, and protected the Mona Lisa on transatlantic journeys. The death of a college student during a football game didn't seem like a particularly daunting assignment, but as Benedict made his way through Waco that morning, he had no idea that he'd stumble onto a cover-up that seemed to lead to the top of Waco's government. <sighs> Anything else you remember about Sessoms and the riot? I heard he was tight. What? Tight. Blotto. Drunk. College boy drunk at a football game, hmm? Well, that's really something. I'm here to solve a murder, not uphold the president's war on liquor. 
Any idea who's spreading these salacious rumors? Mayor Connolly. <clears throat> Can you spell that for me? Wait, you mean like the mayor mayor of Waco? I heard him say it himself. <laughs> well now, that might actually be something. Waco Mayor Herschel Connolly had his own story about the riot, and it turned out he'd spent the last three weeks telling it to everyone who'd listen. According to the mayor, he had heroically run onto the field that day to break up the fight, and then personally witnessed the attack that killed Charles Sessoms. Benedict headed over to Conley's house on his first night in Waco, but the mayor's wife sent him away, saying that Conley was busy and couldn't see him. So bright and early the next morning, Benedict woke up and made his way to the mayor's office in downtown Waco. This time, Mayor Connolly agreed to speak to the detective. But it turned out that his memory of the riot was surprisingly different from all of the other witnesses Benedict had spoken to. Coffee? I'm set. Suit yourself. But as I was saying, Sessoms was loaded, completely drunk, and he started the fight himself. The Baylor boy was just defending himself. Defending himself with a club. Oh! Who's to say what those young men were thinking? Caught up in the heat of the moment, you know? Right. You say you got a good look at him, even down to the pattern on his tie. I assume that means you can identify him if you see him again? Well, it all happened so fast. I told you I didn't recognize him. Don't expect me to be able to pick him out of a Baylor lineup. You know how memory gets. If you didn't recognize him, how do you know he was from Baylor? What? Nothing. Benedict left the mayor's office on November 23rd with more questions than he had when he arrived. Multiple witnesses swore that Sessoms was sober during the riot, including the boy who had been with him that entire day. The claim that Sessoms had instigated the attack went against the other witness statements as well. If that was the case, then maybe Charles Sessoms' death wasn't a murder at all. It might have been self-defense. Or that was how Connolly wanted it to sound. The mayor was strangely evasive about the killer's identity. If the man could describe the boy right down to the pattern on his tie, he should have been able to recognize the killer if he saw him again. And it was strange that he knew the boy was a Baylor student, but claimed to have never met him before. These strange discrepancies raised questions about the mayor's sincerity. And only a few hours later, Benedict met a man in Waco who gave him an answer one that threw some serious complications into Benedict's supposedly easy case. You didn't hear it from me, but Earl down at the gas pump told me Sniper killed him. This Earl doesn't sound too bright. Sesums died from a blow to the head, not a bullet. No, not a Sniper rifle, Sniper, the old Baylor football player. Pardon me if I'm not up on your old college lineups. Does Sniper have a name? Yeah, Hubert, Hubert Connolly. Did you say Connolly? As in Mayor Connolly? That's him. He's the mayor's third cousin. Coming up, Benedict's investigation leads him deep into the Waco mayor's family tree and possibly explains why the local police never even looked for Sesame's killer. Now back to the story. On Tuesday, November 23, 1926, Pinkerton private eye Ela Floyd Benedict stumbled upon a lead in Waco, Texas that shattered everything he thought he knew about the death of Charles Sessoms. If Benedict's new source was telling the truth, then there was a rumor spreading around town that a man named Hubert Sniper Connolly killed Sessoms, a man who also happened to be the Waco mayor's third cousin. One thing was clear. If he was going to follow the sniper lead, he needed to make sure he could trust his informant. So he headed back to the boy who first mentioned the sniper Connolly tip and asked him to put it in writing. But when Benedict asked him to sign an official witness statement, the boy refused. I know better than to stick my neck on the line for this one. Think again, pal. I'm not going after the mayor's own kin without hard evidence. Your statement would be a start. You told me. I know what I told you. If you want a real witness, go talk to Earl at the gas station. I'm just the messenger here. Yeah, yeah. Beat it, kid. With pleasure. 
And so, Benedict set out to find the gas station worker named Earl, who first started spreading Sniper Connolly's name around Waco. And two days later, on November 26th, he finally found him. But once again, Benedict hit a brick wall. Sure, I'm the one who told Rooks about Sniper, but I didn't actually see him. What's that supposed to mean? I just heard someone say it was Sniper when I was leaving the game. Well then, who said it? Hmm, guess I can't recall. Can't or won't? Oh, I'm up. Come back if you need an oil change. Benedict's big lead was crumbling around him. Benedict was still suspicious. There might be a reason that his sources had cold feet about coming forward. Maybe they were afraid of what could happen to someone who turned against the mayor and a beloved college football star in a town like Waco. So he decided to go find Hubert Sniper Connolly himself. Yeah? Mr. Connolly, I'm Detective Benedict. You must be the gumshoe asking around town about me. Glad you decided to quit the gossip and come straight to the source. Come on in. But the minute Benedict saw the former Baylor football star, he likely knew he'd made a mistake. The A&M investigation had spoken to witness after witness who all said the same thing. The killer was short, and Hubert Connolly was at least 5'9". Hubert did tell Benedict that he was at the Cotton Palace Stadium during the riot. He said he even went down to the field to try and help the mayor break it up. But it wasn't enough to make him a real suspect. And since even the people who first started these rumors refused to stand behind them, Benedict was forced to let it go. By the middle of December, the Pinkerton detective had been in Waco for nearly a month, and he was no closer to solving the mystery than he was when he arrived. Benedict continued to interview Baylor students in hopes that one of them would let a piece of information slip that would push his case forward but instead he just heard the same vague description of the killer. At least, until he met Ralph Wolf. Wolf was Baylor University's athletic director, and he'd been on the field during the riot. When Detective Benedict sat down with Wolf on December 19th, the man began by telling him the same story he'd heard over and over since the investigation began. According to Wolf, He saw a man in a blue suit hit Sesums with what seemed to be a wooden chair leg. But the next thing Wolf said stopped Benedict cold. There's a rumor going around the player's locker room that Sniper Conley is the one who did it. Yeah, I've heard that one. I already talked to Hubert. Didn't pan out. Who? No, not Hubert. His cousin, Edwin. The other Sniper. Are you saying there are two Sniper Connollys? Of course. They call him Little Sniper, on account of him being short. Maybe Benedict's suspicions about Mayor Connolly were right after all. He'd just been after the wrong Connolly. Benedict quickly wrapped up his interview with Wolf and headed straight to Ed Connolly's house that same afternoon. This could finally be the break he'd been waiting for. Ed Connolly fit the witness descriptions almost perfectly. He was in his early 20s, around 140 pounds, and roughly 5 foot 5. And that wasn't all. Yeah, I was there. I ran down right as the riot was breaking up. Doesn't mean I did it though, does it? And yeah, I was wearing my blue suit that day. I love that suit. Why do you ask? All the pieces were falling into place. But Benedict still didn't have hard evidence tying Ed Conley to the murder. He at least needed an eyewitness to confirm that Ed was the killer. On December 30th, 1926, Detective Benedict contacted a witness from the riot named Y.C. Carlisle in Waxahachie, Texas, asking if Carlisle would come to Waco and take a look at Ed. A positive identification would finally give him something concrete to act on. It's unclear why, exactly, Benedict went to Carlisle instead of any of the other numerous witnesses who he'd spoken to during his five-week investigation. Maybe Carlisle was one of the only people who said they'd gotten a look at the murderer's face. Or maybe being an out-of-towner meant that he wasn't afraid of whatever retaliation might come from the Waco mayor's office. But unfortunately, Benedict never got a chance to meet with Carlisle. 
On December 31st, the detective received a mysterious message from his bosses, ordering him to end his investigation at once. Pinkerton was closing the case on Charles Sessoms. They ordered him to leave Waco and return to the Pinkerton field office in Dallas right away for a new assignment. There's no clear explanation for why Pinkerton abruptly stopped the murder investigation right as Benedict found a break in the case. It's possible that the group of A&M alumni who hired the detective agency only paid them through the end of 1926. Or maybe someone realized that Benedict was closing in on the truth and was powerful enough to put an end to his entire investigation before he got there. But even if Charles Sessom's killer was never found, the impact of his death rippled out for years to come. Around the same time Benedict left Waco for good, in December 1926, Baylor President Samuel Brooks and President Walton at Texas A&M signed a pact to put an end to the football rivalry that had spiraled out of control. In consideration of the strained athletic relation now existing between the student bodies of Baylor University and A&M College, we, the presidents of the said two institutions, hereby cancel all existing contracts heretofore made by these schools. We appeal to the public that it help us to grow a better feeling between the two student bodies to the end that at some future time a renewal of games may be made. In the spring of 1927, as A&M's senior class prepared to graduate without Charles Sessoms, the university's yearbook printed a brief tribute to their fallen classmate. He died, quote, in line of duty, the page read, along with a photo of Sessoms and a poem promising that Sessoms will always live in Aggie Halls of Fame. But, of course, the two schools eventually forgot about Charles Sessoms, in 1932, Baylor and Texas A&M even began playing football together again. The college football rivalry that was almost as old as the sport itself was back. By then, all the students involved in the 1926 riot, likely including the killer himself, had graduated and moved on to families and careers, and the unsolved murder of Charles Sessoms became nothing more than a sad footnote in Texas football history. Ultimately, when we lay out all the facts, I think that one of the Connolly boys likely killed Charles Sessoms, and that Mayor Connolly protected them from criminal charges. The mayor was so evasive and strange in his interview with the private detective. It's also suspicious that his police force never even opened an investigation. I think you're right. Ed Connolly, or Little Sniper, fits the killer's description perfectly, right down to the blue suit. It's unclear how involved Mayor Connolly was, but it definitely seems like he knew more than he was telling. But no matter who killed Charles Sessoms, the true cause of his death was the violent football rivalry itself. That 1926 halftime brawl wasn't the first riot between sports fans. It certainly wasn't the last, but no game is worth the price of a life. And Charles Sessoms will always be remembered as the tragic casualty of fandom gone too far. <laughs> 